All right, everyone, we're going to get started. Um, just to let you know, I'm going to mute everyone for the, the ease of the presentation. And then at the end, I'll make an opportunity for you to type in questions and contact me directly via email or phone with any additional questions from the presentation. Um, topic for today is geothermal. Um, we've had an overwhelming amount of questions and requests for you know, additional information and training on geothermal, and it's really a, an attest to how popular this is becoming in the industry. So I have done my best to make this the most comprehensive presentation on geothermal to help anyone in the industry who is either brand new to geothermal, residential, or commercial. Hopefully you'll t come away with some new information. Um, but also as a forewarning, because of you know, the comprehensive nature of this presentation, I may exceed the one hour mark. So just for your information now, we will be recording this presentation and posting it to our website, um, tecmongo.com, under the training link. So you can go back, log in, and watch this presentation in its entirety if you have to log out early. So with that, let's get started. We've got a lot on the agenda for uh, geothermal. Um, I'm going to go through everything that I can, consumer interest, history on geo, um, we're going to go over products um, available in the market, how to size and select, and we'll obviously dive into the loop field design and installation. So let's get started with Geothermal 101, so basics on geothermal. Um, this slide usually gets a laugh out of people, um, but you know, the perception is changing. I would have said if five years ago you mentioned geothermal to a consumer or, or anyone, this is what they would think of. This is the mental image they would have. They think of the geysers and the hot springs and things like that. And this is kind of the perception that's changing. But to define geothermal energy, there's actually three different categories, and they're defined by temperatures. So if you start with the basics, geothermal just basically means earth heat. Um, there's three different classifications, low grade, medium grade, and high grade. And like I said, they're all based on ground temperatures. Low grade is from 50 to 65 degrees, and it's available everywhere in the world. Medium grade is 80 to 250 degrees. High grade is 300 to 700 degrees. Now, low grade is what we actually use for geothermal in the HVAC marketplace. So if you look at this map here, everywhere where there's white dots is geothermal application. It's available everywhere. You see orange is medium grade, and red is high grade. Now, to define each one of those a little simpler, the high and medium grade geothermal energy actually comes from within the Earth. That heat is generated from the Earth's pressure between tectonic plates or from the pressure of the core. Um, it actually heats water from within the Earth and sometimes converts it to steam like geysers. So this is the classification that hot springs and geysers actually fall under. It's a higher or medium grade geothermal energy. Low grade geothermal energy actually comes from an external source, the sun. So low-grade geothermal energy is energy absorbed from the sun into the Earth's crust. And this is why it's available everywhere on Earth. Low-grade is what we use for residential, or I'm sorry, for geothermal and the HVAC applications. Now here's why I like to just throw out some of the different names that geothermal systems have in the industry. So you'll see a geothermal system re referenced by any of these different terms, whether it's a geothermal heat pump, a ground loop heat pump, a geo exchange system, all these different terms mean the exact same thing and they're talking about the same technology. So when you're out there looking through the literature and you know seeing some of the different lingos, as long as you have a general understanding that they all technically mean the same thing, the same type of geothermal energy that you're tapping into. We look at a map of the ground temperatures across the United States. We see that in Illinois, in that light green territory, we're actually at about 55 degrees year-round. Our ground temperature is 55 degrees, which puts us in a really favorable position to utilize geothermal technology. Most people assume that heat pumps, you know, they associate heat pumps with southern climates. But the southern climates and the western climates in the United States actually have warmer ground temperatures, which doesn't make a, a beneficial um, source for cooling. Um, so actually in Illinois at 55 degrees, we're at a favorable temperature to utilize geothermal systems for heating and for cooling. So we're actually in the best place in the U.S. to do this. The history of geothermal actually started back in the 1800s when people started noticing that the temperature of the ground doesn't change below, we're talking below the frost line, the temperature stays the same year round. And so they started taking these ground temperatures and using that information. 
The first geothermal system ever installed was actually hot water from a hot spring that was piped into a house. So they were utilizing that quote-unquote medium-grade geothermal energy. But in the early 1900s, Europe kind of jumped on that bandwagon of hydronic systems and started utilizing the groundwater to heat and cool spaces. Um, the first U.S. installation was in the mid-1900s. There's debate, there's a, you know, installation in Ohio and Indianapolis, but basically we're looking at the mid-1900s for a first U.S. geothermal installation. And then it was 20 years later, 20 or 30 years later, that the commercial manufacturers started mass producing geothermal equipment. So that's the brief history. It, the technology has been around for a very, very long time. And obviously in Europe, they've been utilizing this technology for a very long time. Um, you can see in the general trend of geothermal unit sales that we're on a definite upward incline. Um, you can see a huge bump in 2007, obviously due to that tax credit, the federal tax credit that's been offered. So that's been a huge contributor to the growth of the geothermal um, technology and market itself. Obviously, you see geothermal everywhere now. It's more of a buzz, and that's why people are asking about it. You see it in the news. You see people wanting to become greener and how to do that, and they're associating geothermal with that. So it's good in promoting the industry and providing awareness to our customers, which gives us in the HVAC industry a new opportunity to touch in on that base. So if we look at kind of like that quote-unquote green movement, right? Green is that generic word that we use to describe everything that is good for the earth. Um, but now we see more and more people that are actually paying a premium for those green products. And they're paying a premium for a variety of reasons. Um, geothermal systems, are, they're energy efficient. And as our fossil fuel costs rise, um, supply decreases. So obviously it's going to continue to rise. We're going to become less dependent, hopefully, on fossil fuels in the future. We're all aware of our you know, gas bills going up, electricity going up. Um, the cost of generating electricity is going up. Um, so it kind of lends ourselves to the greener products, the renewable energy. Um, geothermal systems are simple and easy to maintain. Um, it applies to retrofit situations and new construction. Um, the technology itself in the unit is not much different than the existing systems we have, split systems or forced air systems. Um, we can apply it to a variety of different applications. Um, it comes into play with a LEED certification, which obviously increases the real estate value of a commercial or a residential property. We've got the tax credits, obviously. But also, all these things are providing increased awareness, and we have more customers that are interested in this technology. This is why it's all kind of balling together to provide a long-term sustainable growth of the geothermal market. And I know a lot of people are skeptical about the 2016 expiration of the tax credit, which we'll talk about a little later. But I think that all the reasons we just looked at on the screen is going to help propel the geothermal market after that tax credit, whether it's renewed or not. I see a continued growth in this industry for all these reasons. Um, so we're talking about awareness of customers. And this is one of the nicest slides that I've used to explain to consumers what is available to them. Um, the ground under their home, whether it's a small piece of property, can actually provide enough energy to heat and cool their entire home. 40 BTUs per cubic foot. So we don't need a lot of energy to provide heating and cooling for a space. So if we look at how a geother geothermal system actually works, um, we talked about the ground temperature as being 55 degrees year-round. So in the winter, if we look at the left hand of the screen here, we're actually taking energy from the earth and moving it into the home. We're pumping heat from the ground to the house heat pump, right? That's where that term came from. We're pumping heat from one location to another. So in the winter, like I said, we're moving heat from the ground into the home. And vice versa, in the summer, we're taking heat out of the home and putting it into the ground. The nice thing about this system is it's cyclical. Um, so utilizing a geothermal system like we can in the Midwest for summer and winter applications actually benefits us because we're able to charge the ground with heat during the summer and use that extra heat in the winter. So it's a very cyclical um, system that works really well in the year-round application. We break down the components of a geothermal system. And this is where most people are surprised because a geothermal unit still includes a refrigerant loop. And most people think it's entirely water-based, and that's not true. It's very similar to any other type of domestic system that we use, forced air system, 
split system furnace condensing unit combination. Um, we're just um, rejecting heat to a groundwater loop instead of outside. Most typical homes have a furnace and an air conditioner. Air conditioner rejects heat to the air. Um, this system just rejects heat to the water. So we have our closed groundwater loop here. We also have a closed refrigerant circuit that's doing the heat, the heat exchange between the water and the coil itself. So we're heating or cooling that air through the refrigerant circuit. So one of our components is that we can use additional energy that we're, that's getting rejected to the ground during the summer to heat domestic hot water. So that's the fourth component of the geothermal system. Now if you're familiar with DX systems, um, refrigerant systems, let's just take a look at what's going on inside this unit. Because basically a heat pump, um, an air-cooled heat pump, is the same as a water-cooled heat pump, except we're rejecting heat to the water instead of to the air outside. So this is essentially a self-contained water-cooled system with just a reversing refrigerant valve. So in the summer, we're actually, the heat exchanger itself here is acting as a condenser, rejecting heat to the water, whereas the coil is acting as our evaporator, taking heat out of the space, essentially cooling the air. In the winter, it's the opposite. The system reverses. The heat exchanger actually acts as an evaporator, and the coil acts as a condenser, heating the air into the space. So we're pulling heat out of the groundwater loop and then rejecting it into the space, heating the home. There's two main types of geothermal products in the industry when we talk generically. Um, so if you're talking geothermal, there's two types of products, water to air and water to water. And it's essential to understand these two systems and the difference between them. Water to air systems basically are a closed water loop with a refrigerant circuit rejecting and exchanging energy with an air side. So you're going from a water side loop, closed water side loop, to an air side loop. You have your outdoor groundwater coil, your refrigerant circuit, and then you have your indoor coil and your blower. Whereas a water to water system, as the, not, as the name defines, you go from a closed water ground loop to another closed water loop inside, typically used for radiant heat applications in floor heat application. So our outside ground water loop here exchanges energy with the refrigerant circuit to another closed um, coaxial water coil. So that's the difference between water to air and water to water. And you'll see those two classifications of units. On any given installation, you may have both. Most commonly you do. Under the water to air classification, there's two types of units. There are packaged units and split units. And we'll define those in a second here. Water-to-water -water units offer two different types as well. They have high temperature and medium temperature water-to-water -water units that each have different applications. So let's back up and let's dive into the water-to-air units specifically. Water-to-air units are packaged systems. And let's scroll ahead. I'm going to break down what the components look like inside a water-to-air packaged unit. Packaged meaning it's self-contained. So the bottom portion of this unit would be the quote-unquote condensing unit section, if that's an easy, easy way to think about it. You have the compressor. You have the coaxial coil for the ground loop heat exchange. You have your electronics and controls. And then the, the air handling side, you have the blower. You have your air side coil and your return filter. So if you look at the system, we actually have our water loop, our outdoor ground water loop coming into the unit. Here's the exchange system with the refrigerant, and here's the air side system exchanging heat to the air side. So if we look at a split system, let's go down, the split system is actually just a separated, what I call, quote unquote, the condensing unit section, because it's the section that has the compressor located in it. This would actually be placed either indoors, outdoors, it could be in a second floor mechanical room. But the this split system enables us to pipe refrigerant to a separate air handler. So we will able, we're able to place an air handler in a, you know, a closet, an attic, a second floor mechanical room. It takes up much less space, and we're able to do the same system, just like we would with a conventional residential split system, with this geothermal unit. It just allows us more flexibility than having to run ductwork through an entire house or having to pipe water through the entire house. Now we can just take some refrigerant piping up to an attic installation, or you know, typically used for a second floor installation. We look at the water-to-air packaged units. They're typically offered in a single-stage scroll compressor and a two-stage scroll compressor, 
anywhere from two to six tons. Um, the reason they offer a two-stage um, compressor system for geothermal, which is where the industry is primarily going, um, is because when we're designing for a geothermal system, we're sizing for the heating load. And typically in a home, the heating load in our area is greater than the cooling load. So we are actually sizing our system for the heating demand in that house or the heat loss in the house. So when it comes summertime, we can actually ramp down the system to match the cooling load, which is usually less than the heating load. So we can still have that dehumidification of the system. We can still um, operate the system without having to cycle the compressor. So we operate both stages during heating, and we ramp back to one stage for cooling. So it's a really great application for residential, um, residential homes. If you will look at the split units, they're offered from two to five tons. They're also offered in an indoor or outdoor version, and they come with the multiple stage compressor as well. If we jump to the water to water units, this is just a nice depiction of what actually you can pipe to a water to water system. Here on the left being your outdoor supply and return pipe from the ground loop. Indoors, you can go to a buffer tank, which then can be tied to radiant and floor heating or radiator systems. You can have that excess water um, energy redirected to your indirect water heater. Use that for your domestic hot water heating. So there's a lot of options on a water-to-water -water system. And you can see that a lot of applications will have both a water-to-water -water and a water-to-air system. Water-to-water -water units are offered, as I mentioned, in a medium and a high-grade system. Um, High-temperature system, I should say. A medium temperature system is offered usually in three, five, and ten ton options residentially. Um, and basically, this medium gray or medium temperature system will provide anywhere from 120 to 125 degree water that's used primarily for radiant in floor heating. A high temperature system is usually offered in one size, usually smaller residentially, but it can produce water temperatures up to 145 degrees. And these are used in applications with older radiant uh, or older homes that use, utilize hydronic heat and some radiators that require a higher temperature water. So those are the applications for a high temp system. More often than not, you'll see the medium temperature as the predominant water to water units used. Now the nice thing about geothermal units, um, I mentioned it's essentially the same as a conventional system. It's just different where we reject the heat to. And the nice thing is that every single residential accessory that you're familiar with applies to this system without any special modification or consideration. So basic thermostats, zoning packages, humidifiers, air cleaners, um, one note and thermostat, as long as it's a heat pump configured thermostat with three stages of heating, two stages of cooling, it's absolutely accessible or applicable to these systems. Um, no special modifications because it is geothermal. Um, and if you are a Carrier or Bryant Infinity Evolution um, lover, you can also apply that zoning or that control technology to these split system options on the water to air units. So that's an added benefit. Now if we go into selection of some of the residential style units, be aware that the Energy Star has changed the minimum requirements for the EER and COP values to be registered as Energy Star um, as of January in 2012. So you can take note and you can reference that some of these values have changed and that's the minimum values that they're rating for Energy Star. And Energy Star is a requirement for the tax credits as well. So you want to make sure that the unit you're selecting is Energy Star rated. When you're doing that, when you're selecting a unit to make sure it's Energy Star rated or, or checking the capacity of the system, if you're referencing the AHRI um, data sheets for each one of the units, and this is a typical picture of what that would look like, it can be a little overwhelming. There's different lingo and technology for geothermal systems and selections um, that make this simple AHR rating confusing. So if we look at it, there's three different classifications given in AHRI for geothermal systems or water loop systems. The first one is a water loop heat pump. And this just basically translates to a boiler tower system, meaning it's a, all the water loop is centralized within the building. Next, we have a ground water heat pump system. And this refers to an open loop geothermal system, meaning we're sourcing water from the ground, bringing that water into the system, and then rejecting it back to the ground or some other water source. Um, this could also be, you know, pulling water in the commercial water source heat pump environment, you know, from Lake Michigan or from the Chicago River directly into your system and rejecting it back out. The last one is what primarily applies to residential geothermal. Um, this is the closed loop system. So this is where we have a closed outdoor loop 
um, for our geothermal system. Now, the other way to de define between these three is you see the actual temperatures used for rating are much different. So a boiler tower system has higher temperatures of water, whereas the open loop has a little lower, and then your closed groundwater loop system actually varies the most between seasons. So if we break that down, if you're actually doing a manual selection of your geothermal unit, um, for the heating season, let's say, because I said for a geothermal system, you do want to size for the heating load, um, if that's your only source of heat, you would go to the reference manuals and the performance data, and what we use is an entering water temperature of 30 degrees as the worst case scenario of a selection point for a geothermal system. So at 30 degree entering water temperature, so that means that the temperature of the water inside that closed loop is 30 degrees, um, which is an, a very common temperature during the winter, which is why we use a glycolor and antifreeze in the system. And this is what we use to select for. So then you would reference your airflow, and you would be able to tell how much heat capacity that geothermal unit can output. Um, the heat of extraction values, HE stands for heat of extraction, that basically defines how much energy that coaxial coil is able to pull from the water loop. Um, but the heat capacity is the value you're actually looking at as the output value of heat this unit can produce. There you can reference your COP values at all your different airflows. So that kind of gives you a base point to select your system based on performance data for each one of the manufacturers. When you are sizing a residential system, like I said, some people have different, um, different opinions, but I like to size personally for the heat loss in the system. Doing an accu accurate manual geocalculation calculation to get a defined heat loss um, and using that to size the geothermal system. Um, typically, like I said, the heating load is greater than the cooling load, so we want to take that into consideration with no other heating source available. Now, when you are using radiant in-floor heating in a home, um, we obviously want you to take that into consideration with your heat load. Um, that may reduce the heating load requirement, obviously. Um, the one thing to keep in mind is that if you are utilizing a water-to-water -water unit to heat your, the water for your radiant and floor heating, in addition to a water-to-air unit to do your airside cooling and second-stage heating, you have to add the capacity of both those units when you design the loop field. And we'll talk about that, but just for instance, if you're utilizing a 5-ton water-to-water -water unit and a 5-ton water-to-air unit, you need to design your loop field for 10 tons of total capacity. Um, and this is not to be overlooked. You have to add the capacity of both those units together. Because during the heating um, season, we want to be able to get enough energy to heat your inflow radiant and also do second stage airside heating. So you want to make sure there's enough capacity built into that field. And also, if you're utilizing radiant um, heating in your home, the fact that you have that additional water source, you can look at doing hot water coils for backup heat um, and in lieu of electric resistance coils, which are sometimes used. The nice thing about residential selections for geothermal is there's many softwares available. Each manufacturer has a software available that you can use to help size your system. Most of these softwares are free. This one I use is GeoDesigner. It's available for free at CarrierGeo.com or BryantGeo.com and basically allows you to help size your system or gauge you know, get a good idea of what the system is going to need. If you take a look, what these softwares basically are is we will reference the bin data by city location. We'll enter in our heating and cooling loads from our manual J's. And we'll use that into a selection software. We'll take that bin data. We'll select the size of the unit. In this case, it's a six-ton geothermal unit to cover the heating load. We will select the loop type. So you can select whether you're going to utilize a vertical um, bore system or horizontal trenching system, whether you're utilizing a pond or you can see open well water, so if it's an open loop system, you can take that into consideration as well. You will also select the soil type. Um, this isn't quite as, um, as important on a residential selection. It is, but the, the conductivity of the soil varies. Uh, how do I say, for a commercial application, it's much more critical. Residentially, not so much. Um, you can see over here, most common is a saturated sand or gravel. Um, what usually happens is you would rely on the expertise of the driller um, that you would subcontract to have knowledge of that ground quality or the soil conductivity. Um, there's multiple areas in the north shores of Chicago that have shale or limestone at 100 or 150 feet. 
So that well driller would have knowledge of that soil conductivity, that soil um, composition to help you size your loop field as well. This is just a starting point to help you estimate your system. Um, damp sand and gravel is a, you know, saturated sand and gravel or damp sand and gravel is a very common place to start and gives you a very conservative number for loop design. So once we've selected some of these preliminary options, what it's going to do, these softwares will give us outputs on the selection of the unit. And basically, there's a few things that I take note of in the selection. First, we go to the heating, because I'm primarily concerned with heating, because that is the greater load. This system will do 96% of the heating um, of that home. And what if we look down, if we go down here to the auxiliary balance point, at 17 degrees ambient temperature, so an outdoor temperature of 17 degrees Fahrenheit, is when we would need to kick in an auxiliary heating system. So, if you look at the bin hours for, you know, this area, 17 degrees of the last winter, we barely hit 17 degrees. So most of the time, a heat pump system will be able to produce all the heating for that, that season. But in the event that you go below 17 degrees, which absolutely happens, we would have a backup heating source available. You could use a hot water coil, or in this case, I selected an electric duct heater. Um, it recommends 10 kW as a backup electric heat source. I wouldn't select a full emergency supplemental heat, but a, an auxiliary heat system would be recommended in this case, unless you selected your unit for 100% of the heating. Now, the other thing that you can take away from the software, obviously you can estimate a total operating cost utilizing that um, hot water generator for domestic heat based on your utility cost. But the other thing is it actually gives us a bore estimate. And this is really handy as a conservative estimate on how much space we would need in our field or in our backyard for a geothermal system. So if you have a customer that doesn't know if they have enough space for geothermal, there's obviously different ways to break that down, but for this six ton unit to get 60 or 96% of the heating, it's recommending roughly 1,300 feet of bore. Now that value is given in a single directional value, meaning we could do two 650 foot wells, or more commonly you would do for 325 foot wells, that would total 1,300 feet. So you would have four individual 325 foot depth wells to get that capacity. And that gives you just an idea of what your layout would look like. I would not take on the individual liability of laying out the system. Utilize the experience of those outdoor drillers because there's certification out there for those drillers. And they are trained how to select and size their field. So utilize and work with them in their knowledge of the soil composition in your area. But this will help you give an idea of different things. Um, each of those bores will be 10 feet from each other and 10 feet from any foundation. So that gives you an idea. If you were doing four vertical wells, you would have to be 10 feet from the home and have at least 40 foot of width in your yard. So that just kind of gives you a starting point. If we were doing a horizontal trenching system, we could do two 600-foot trenches or four 325-foot trenches, which is why horizontal systems obviously require more ground space. Um, so if you have that big yard that you can utilize, trenching is very inexpensive, and that's another way to just approximate the area. So these software tools are very, very helpful in gauging preliminary data for uh, the system layout, but also giving you very detailed information on your unit selections. So if we move on, um, some of the other things that you would select for a geothermal system would be um, the hot water generator. This is an option for most units. A lot of them come factory installed, and we'll talk about what we call the hot water generator or the de-superheater, which is used to contribute heat to the domestic hot water system. Another accessory is Cooper Nickel heat exchangers. So if you're utilizing an open loop system, which we'll talk about, where you're pumping water from another uh, outdoor well source or, you know, a pond or lake directly into the heat exchanger, we would select the Cooper Nickel heat exchanger because it is more robust um, to combat the minerals in the water and any other particles in that water that would break down the heat exchanger. I talked about auxiliary backup heaters. This is an electric resistance heater that can actually be mounted within the geothermal unit. So these actually slide into the geothermal unit themselves below the blower, so you don't take up any additional duct space. We'll also be selecting flow controllers or flow centers. And I'll talk about that now and I'll explain. A flow controller is essentially a pumping station. Very simple. It's a box with one or two pumps on it 
And actually what it does is pump the water through the outdoor loop field. It manages the head pressure of that loop field and also it regulates the flow of water to the indoor unit. So we typically design systems at 3 GPM per ton. So this unit would regulate, if this was a 5 ton unit, this unit would have, this flow control would regulate 15 GPMs to this unit to make sure it has constant accurate water flow to extract enough heat. Now these flow controllers themselves are very simple. Basically they're just standard pumps, fractional horsepower pumps, with um, three-way valves for flushing the system, um, pump purge connections. You would connect the in um, the supply from the outdoor loop, um, the return from the outdoor loop. There's a backflow preventer um, built into the system, but it's very straightforward and gets mounted close to the unit in the basement and close to your um, wall penetration. If you look at a typical layout in maybe a basement, um, let's say this is a residential home, this is the you know, water to air unit for the first floor, this is the water to air unit for the second floor, this may be the water to water unit for the in-floor radiant heating. We would have a flow controller for each one of these units individually. Um, you can design your own flow controller system by utilizing inline pumps, but this design is very simple and it allows us to use smaller fractional horsepower pumps. So if this unit engages itself um, when these two are not calling um, for operation, this flow controller can operate the entire loop field of the system and regulate just the GPM required um, to this unit and overcome just the, the head pressure of this unit itself in the loop field. So it allows a more simple design, um, simple servicing, redundancy, etc. Double O-ring fittings are the things that we use to connect the flow controller um, to the piping. Um, so these are really easy. You can use barbed or socket fusion. Um, you can do um, the uh, fusion welding connection to the flow controller from the unit um, to the outdoor loop field. Also, hose kits. Many um, residential manufacturers provide hose kits, which would be used. Um, this is where your fittings would go here on the supply and return and the supply and return of the flow controller. Um, the hose kit. If your um, unit, if your flow controller is located next to your unit, you can utilize just a rubber hose connection here with fittings and connectors that we can provide. It makes it a very easy installation and connection for um, an HVAC contractor. So if you're new to the geothermal industry and you would subcontract an outdoor driller, he would bring all the connections in into this flow controller. Then you would only be required to connect this rubber hose, uh, which would make it very easy for you and wouldn't require require additional equipment like a fusion welding tool. So if you are subcontracting your outdoor loop contractor, make sure that that's part of their bid and they're including that if that's something you're not comfortable doing. I want to talk just briefly on the hot water generator. This system, or sometimes called D superheater, what it does is it's another set of water connections on the unit itself. And more commonly during the summer when we're rejecting excess heat to the outdoor loop field, we can direct some of that heat um, into the domestic hot water system first. So we can dump that into the hot water heater and contribute to the temperature in the tank without having to use a gas or an electric system. Now when you're using an electric hot water heater, this allows us to set two different temperatures within the tank, uh, which is very helpful and it makes a much easier integration to the hot water generator. I will make note that if you are utilizing a gas hot water heater, you will have to also include a buffer tank to utilize the hot water generator. Um, this is because the temperature settings, um, you have to have two different temperature settings to utilize the energy from the, the hot water generator. Um, you have to have a big enough offset so it actually absorbs that energy. So you would have to take into consideration an additional buffer tank if you utilize a hot water gas, um, hot water um, water heater. I'm sorry, a gas fired water heater. Um, so you would take that into consideration. Um, there has been the change to the tax credit that this hot water generator or de-superheater, sometimes called, is no longer required for you to qualify for the tax credit because of this reason. Um, most, um, most homes have a, a gas hot water heater and the additional buffer tank most homeowners didn't have room for or it affects the payback cost of the system. So they remove that from the requirement of the tax credit. Um, so it's, you don't have to um, connect that part of the system. It's just an option if you want to contribute to your domestic hot water and, and reduce that, um, that utility. As a reference, if you are sizing a buffer tank, 
We use as a rule of thumb 7 to 10 gallons per ton. So anywhere between, if this is a six-ton system, any, you know, a 50-gallon water heater, or I mean a 50-gallon buffer tank would be a perfect size. Really quickly, I want to go through some of the commercial water source heat pump applications and systems themselves. Um, it's the same technology um, as a geothermal system, just utilized in a different way. Units come with different accessories and different features, um, but it's fully integrated in the market, and you should be aware of what's available on the water source heat pump side as well. Water source heat pump applications obviously go anywhere from apartments, condominiums, schools, universities. They're utilized in many more applications. Um, and have been traditionally for a long time, especially in downtown applications where hydronic systems are much easier to utilize and pipe throughout a building. We can integrate a water source heat pump system. Now, water source heat pumps have different advantages and disadvantages. Um, because it is a uh, system that can be used for small zones, we have low diversity, so we can exchange heat into the water loop system. It's also flexible and very high efficient, as we were talking about. The zoning capabilities are fantastic multiple small zones with um, high occupancy changes. Um, there's a low installation cost because you're just piping water using pumps to you know pipe that water in any direction for any degree of rise or, um, or level of floors. Um, flexibility to control. Some of the disadvantages is that you may still have to provide a separate dedicated ventilation system. Um, since we're piping water to various fan coils throughout the building, you could bring in your fresh air to those individual fan coils or have a DOAS dedicated ventilation system. Filtration is another aspect you'd have to main, you'd have to address at each individual unit. Um, you have to run condensate. And also, most of these uh, water source heat pumps are located in a ceiling space in commercial applications, so access to these units for maintenance um, needs to be considered. Commercial water source heat pumps are applied in three different ways. Um, most commonly, um, Traditionally, I should say, boiler tower loops on the left here are the most common water source heat pump application. Now, this is not utilizing a ground source um, for the energy. So this is not a traditional geothermal system. Um, but you would have the boiler system, you would have the cooling tower, um, and then you would have a water loop to each one of the individual, individual units. You'd exchange heat within low cost, you know, considerably efficient. The next common system that we typically have in Chicago as well is an open loop system. So this would be pumping water from another source directly into the building. Now, in the late 90s, this actually became a considerable problem with zebra mussels um, in the Chicago River and Lake Michigan because we're actually pulling water directly into the units themselves and directly into the system. So not only do you have to consider treatment of the water, but with the zebra mussel case, um, fertilized eggs were actually being pulled into the system and growing on the insides of the pipes and uh, you know, coagulating some of the pipes. So this is just one of the different considerations for open loop system. It requires additional maintenance and possibly water, um, water filtration and water treatment. Um, if you look at a ground loop system, so a commercial application utilizing the same water source heat pump, and each of these water source heat pumps can be the exact same unit. It's just different on where you're sourcing your energy or your water. Um, in the ground application, similar to residential, we're utilizing ground loops, whether most typically for commercial is vertical bores, and pulling that energy directly into the space, rejecting or exchanging heat with the ground. So this is becoming more and more prevalent with uh, the newer um, water source heat pump applications to not only get the efficiency of the system, but it does have a higher initial cost because of the bore drilling. If you look at percentage of system installations currently, a large percentage utilize boiler and cooling towers, um, whereas only 25% are ground sourced. That 25% number is growing with more municipalities and um, uh, schools and government buildings um, doing a ground source type of application and funding that green um, HVAC movement, um, you'll see that number grow. But we'll focus on most of the ground source here. So available to use geothermal um, water source heat pumps, there's six different commercial product types. We've got horizontal, vertical, console, rooftops, vertical stacks, and also water-to-water -water units. You can see that the horizontal units in a smaller tonnage, three-quarter to two or three tons, makes up half the commercial water source heat pump market. So that is the most common in the industry. Horizontal units um, 
under the carrier line, you have the 50 PTs, PSs, PCs. Um, these are smaller tonnage sizes for commercial high-rise applications. You also have the 50 HQ, which is the large capacity horizontal units that can go up to 10 tons. We look at the vertical style. The vertical also has a commercial model that goes up to 25 tons, the commercial VQ, but then you also have the same PT, PS, and P, um, C series that's offered in a vertical configuration, upflow, downflow, et cetera. Commercially, the vertical stack system is a very popular um, installation system only because it, it's a self-contained system in that it takes up a small amount of space within the, the unit and we can do vertical piping runs where the piping connections will actually connect to them, they connect from floor to floor, making the installation um, cost a lot lower than a, a traditional water source sequence application. Console systems are also a very part, making up a quarter of the business, just under a quarter of the water source heat pump market today. Rooftop and water to water systems are obviously a smaller portion of the water source heat pump business, but they will be growing in popularity when we integrate a lot more of the ground floor systems. Um, Rooftop equipment is obviously great for serving larger corridors and domestic spaces, and if we're already utilizing a groundwater system, we can incorporate now that rooftop equipment in that. Sizing commercial equipment is a little bit different than residential. We have more, um, more requirements as far as entering and leaving water temperatures to design our boiler system and our cooling tower system or our ground loop system, so we utilize software to do the selection as well. Now, we can always select based on specific entering and leaving water temperatures, which will give us a range of options over EER values, COP values, water flows, and CFMs that we can match to an existing building system or for new construction and design. The one difference about a commercial water source heat pump, because they are either designed for a boiler tower system or a geothermal system, the only difference is the range, the temperature range that that unit can accept. Standard range units used for boiler tower loops, the water temperature within the system ranges from 60 to 95 degrees. Whenever we utilize that same water source heat pump for a geothermal application, meaning we're sourcing water from open loop or from a ground loop system, we want to select an extended range package, meaning that unit can handle operating temperatures of anywhere from, or water temperatures anywhere from 20 to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's more robust in the system of the temperature of water it can handle. Obviously, your accessories are different for commercial systems because we're typically looking at a primary, secondary, and looping system, different pumps to handle the, the, the system itself. So there's no pre-configured um, pump stations, essentially, for commercial equipment. Most of the units um, are de-featured, um, and you can add on accessories and other features as you go through um, and select that within these softwares. All these softwares are free and available to you guys. Um, you can download um, at carrier or bryantgeo.com, commercial information at commercial.carrier.com, and HVC Partners will have downloads for that commercial water source heat pump selection software. All right, moving on. We're doing all right here on time. If we look at loop field design for geothermal systems, and this is where a lot of questions arise um, from customers. And, even though you may be hiring or subcontracting an outdoor loop contractor to do the drilling and the installation of the loop field, it's good to have a general understanding of what that entails so that you know that you're hiring a quality installer and he knows, um, he knows the business and the geothermal um, installation procedures. So just to start out, there's four main types of geothermal wells that we use. The first, obviously, is a vertical closed loop system meaning this is entirely closed loop. We are using the same water over and over throughout the loop system um, and is never exposed to any of the other spaces. We have the horizontal closed loop system as well, utilizing trenches. We have pond and lake closed loop systems. So instead of exchanging heat with the ground, we are putting coils in the water in a lake or body, uh, a lake or body of water. But this is also a closed loop system. So this is the same water that we're filling in the system, pressurizing it, and then running it through that system. The last is the open loop or well type system, where you're sourcing water from one location, bringing it into the unit itself, and then discharging it at a separate location, hopefully into the same body of water or aquifer. The open loop systems we'll talk about a little bit more, but you always want to check with the, um, the local restrictions or regulations in your counties. They may have some more restrictions on open loop systems, um, and it is more maintenance for you. But let's talk about each one of these systems. Um, closed loop versus open loop. 
to define the two because it, it's good to understand the difference. Um, a closed loop system utilizes a continuous plastic pipe looping system. And it is closed. You have the same water flowing through that system. You only fill it once, you pressurize it, and you seal it. You can use that for the horizontal trenches, vertical, or pond design. Open loop systems utilize groundwater. Um, so water used from, uh, you can pull surface water from a lake. You can use well water. It's actually pulling in that water from that body, of, body or source directly into the heat exchanger itself. So you're going to want to, A, look at your water quality that you're bringing in. If you have a lot of minerals or high in iron, this will corrode the heat exchanger. So you may want to look at water filtration or water treatment before you bring that in. And always on open loop systems, we recommend Cooper Nickel heat exchangers. These heat exchangers will last longer, um, but there is an additional maintenance feature that is associated with um, open loop systems only because of the constant degradation on that heat exchanger. So you will be replacing that heat exchanger. Um, not, you know, if you use Cooper Nickel, it's hard to give you a value, but you would say every five to seven years um, before the change of the entire unit itself, you would at least once have to change your heat exchanger. Soil conductivity is another important component when it comes to um, geothermal design. And we talked about that when we were looking at the software. Obviously, in a commercial application, it is much, much more susceptible um, to a soil conductivity only because of the sheer mass of um, wells that we're, dr we're drilling. And so we want to be very accurate as to how much capacity we're, we need out of that system, how deep we have to go with the bores, and how many we have to do because it's amplified in, um, in number. There's different types of, obviously, soil conductivities. And the way it's rated, the lower the number, um, the worse, I guess, conductivity or heat exchange the system has. So if you look, soil conductivity of, of 0.5, which relates to maybe a dry system. If you think of Nevada, very dry sand, very dry ground. There's not a lot of water in that soil or that sand to do a lot of heat exchanging. So you would require more wells in your system. As you go higher on the, the soil thermal conductivity rating scale, you actually get better heat transfer from that medium um, into the water. So you would require less bores and um, wells itself. Um, what's shocking to most people is that rock actually um, scores higher. Um, it can range anywhere from a very low to a very high conductivity number. And depending on the porousness of the um, rock itself, if it is, um, you know, a very porous rock that holds a lot of water, it can have a very, very high conductivity rate, which is actually better than soil. Um, soil kind of, general soil scales, you know, right in the middle around one for conductivity. But some rock can actually be a better conductor of that heat. Some rock is not. Uh, but it's just one thing to keep in mind, it does affect the system itself. So on a commercial system, you would have to hire someone to come out and do coil con soil conductivity tests. So you could be very accurate with the amount of the amount and size of your field. Residentially, it's not quite as, a, as big of a component. Um, you'll have enough extra capacity in a residential size system um, in your loop field to overcome any soil conductivity issues. If we look at specifically closed loop design, some of the benefits of doing a closed pressurized loop design, um, you can do pressurized or non-pressurized. I'm afraid of me, I'm going to focus on pressurized systems today. Um, a pressurized closed-loop system means that it is sealed and closed. Um, an open-loop system, you can constantly add water or you can constantly treat the system. So if we focus on closed pressurized systems, there's lower system maintenance. Um, we don't have to treat the water. It's closed. It's clean. It operates continuous for the life cycle of the unit itself. Um, one of the hurdles is that there is a higher initial cost um, and there's more land required. So when we're doing a closed-loop horizontal system, for instance, there's more trenching and land that's required um, than just doing an open loop system where you just, you're doing a, what we call the pump and dump um, with two pipes for supply and one for return. A closed loop design for um, design rule of thumbs is three GPM per ton is what we're selecting for the equipment in the field. Um, there's pressure and temperature reports on all units. So when we service these systems, because it does have a refrigerant cycle, we're not necessarily actually servicing that. We're not walking up to a geothermal unit and attaching refrigerant gauges. We're actually checking pressures and temperatures of that, of that water loop. We want to see that we have you know, accurate pressures in the system so we don't have a water leak. 
but we also want to check our temperatures to make sure we're actually getting good heat exchange between the loop itself, the loop water, and the, the heat exchanger in the unit. For closed-loop design, we usually use um, three-quarter inch pipe um, for three-quarter, I'm sorry, for three GPM. Anywhere from three-quarter inch to an inch and a half is common um, for the, the individual uh, trenches or bores. When you get to the main supply and return, you'll usually see anywhere from one and a quarter to two inch pipe. Um, after the, obviously, the larger the pipe size, the harder it is, um, it's less malleable, it's harder to work with in the field. So most people use a three quarter or one inch pipe in the field um, for most of their loops. Um, we will also do a reverse return header um, in each one of these systems, and I'll show you what that means. For a close-up design, we're also going to be selecting and sizing those pumps. Um, we will actually take a calculation of the head pressure of the loop field. So, you know, a loop, a vertical loop field that's 500 feet deep has a greater head pressure um, than a loop field that's only 200 feet deep. So we need to make sure we size those pumps to be able to overcome the head pressure of that loop field and the pressure drop within the system on uh, the unit itself. Um, we're also going to try and select those pumps so we get a larger Reynolds number above 2,500. Basically, what Reynolds number means, it's the turbulence within the system. So how turbulent the water is within the tubes. The more turbulent the water, the better heat exchange capabilities we have between that, that water and the ground itself. If you have laminar flow through the tubes, that means the water is not making contact with the entire surface area of the tube, and we get less heat transfer. Um, so that there is a little bit more design going into the pumps, and you want to make sure that there's good communication between your outdoor loop contractor and whoever is selecting and sizing or helping you do that pump selection. You want to make sure there's good communication between them. On vertical loops, um, it used to be traditional to say one bore per ton. Um, and that can be true for smaller systems. If your loop is 150 foot deep, that, that could be a true number. But now we see um, vertical uh, wells anywhere up from 150 to 500 feet, even for residential applications. So we're actually fitting multiple tons in each well to reduce the amount of space. We're seeing more and more applications in um, urban environments where lots are very small. So we're actually fitting more capacity into each individual bore and taking them deeper to do that. Each of the bores, if you look at this diagram, each of the bores themselves, we like 10 feet of space in between in each direction. And as I mentioned earlier, 10 feet to any, um, uh, I just lost the word, 10 feet to any um, basement uh, foundation. Um, because you do have the capability to freeze some of the ground, and you don't want to do any freezing around a foundation structure. You don't want to shift that ground in any way. Um, a lot of the vertical boring also, um, what happens when you do a vertical bore is they will either do a U-bend or it will do a connection. They will put the, the single supply and return U-bend into the hole, and they will backfill it with a bentonite grout. This is proper procedure per IGSPA certification for a lot of drillers. So when you are subcontracting your driller, you want to make sure that he has a certification either through IGSPA or another organization. IGSPA is one of the most recognized for um, geothermal drilling. But on vertical loops, what happens is um, this bentonite grout goes into the hole and fills. And what it's kind of like a it's like a cement slurry. It's like a sawdust and cement slurry that gets backfilled, and it expands to two or three times its size as it dries. So what that does is it makes a solid connection between the pipe itself and the ground space. So if you backfill a 200-foot well, you're never going to be able to get ground compacted around that well to get really good exchange between the ground and the pipe itself. So that's what that bentonite grout does. In addition, that bentonite grout seals in that tube. So for any reason there is a leak in that tube or a leak in the system, it isolates that tube from the ground, keeping any of the propylene or antifreeze from getting into the groundwater sources. Here's some typical um, vertical loops. This is the standard single tube vertical trench. You would have a 180 fitting on the bottom um, or a U-bend system, and then you would backfill all this entire area with the bentonite slurry. If you are on a small lot line and you want to put two wells, two um, U-bend systems um, into one, two uh, circuits into one well, you can do that. You obviously get less capacity because you're trying to pull heat out of the same space, but you can actually 
um, you know, get one and a half the capacity um, than you can of a single, um, a single circuit per well. Um, sometimes shallower loops are used if you hit um, a material that you can't drill through or um, if you hit an open body of water or aquifer. Um, they'll typically do um, single double loop shorter um, bores. That's also common. Here's some handy pictures of what vertical loops look like. You see here is the supply and return of the, the U-Bend system coming out of the, the well. You see the betonite slurry that has expanded outside of the well itself. Just gives you a good idea. Standard drilling trucks um, to do the vertical installations. They come with a coil and they back feed that coil down into the well itself. So they'll drill the hole and then go back, backfill, um, or put the pipe into the circuit, the circuit into the well, and then backfill it with the button like um, slurry. This is just to give you an idea of what a typical picture of a drilling truck would look like. It includes the grout mixer, a grout pump water supply. They'll have to pull in to do the drilling itself. They'll have the hose reel, and they'll have trimming pipe um, to do the actual boring. Um, but this is a, a common um, truck that you would see to do a geothermal installation. Most of the installations have multiple vertical bores um, in the system. Um, and this is an example of the reverse return fashion. So the supply that comes out, um, that would connect down at the bottom there. So the first well that's drilled down is actually the last to return to the initial system. And it balances out um, the water flow through each one of the circuits. Um, and this is what we would call the header pit. So this area, this reverse return area where we connect each individual bore, these would be 10 feet apart from each other. And where we would connect that right here would be what we would call our header pit. Um, that header pit we like to, like I said, locate 10 feet from a foundation structure. All right, if we jump onto horizontal loops, um, horizontal loops can be done in a variety of fashion. You can jump back there with your shovel and start digging a trench. You can use a backhoe, um, an excavator. Um, there's a lot of different resources that you can use. Um, traditionally, a, um, a, a horizontal bore or a horizontal um, trench doesn't have to be more than four or five inches wide and only needs to be um, installed below the frost line. So we're talking an average of four feet of depth. So this is very easy for a consumer to go out and do on their own, or it's very um, it's less uh, it's less expensive to do um, because of the tools that are required. Um, everything needs to be installed below the frost line, as I mentioned, which is typically four feet. Um, you can go deeper than that, but I think once you exceed that six or seven foot level, then you get into the OSHA requirements for um, you know bracing the sides of the walls so nothing collapses in on you. But most of these um, trenches don't they only have to be wide enough to fit both three-quarter inch pipes uh, for the supply return. So they're, they're rather narrow. Um, trenches, like I said, there's no rule of thumb, basically. We're using the capacity of the system. And, you know, you can fit more capacity in a longer trench depending on what your lot looks like. And, and your trench doesn't have to be straight. You don't have to have straight trenches. You can loop around or go in different directions. Um, uh, the, ground doesn't, the ground doesn't care which way you go. Now, if we take a cross-sectional view of some horizontal loops, um, similar to vertical, we can put more than one circuit in a trench. Um, you obviously get less capacity when you're trying to do heat exchange by multiple circuits in the same trench. Um, typically, what we would recommend is a single two-pipe, either vertical or horizontal. Um, supply and return 10 feet from the next trench. You want 10 feet in between these two trenches. Now, if you build a, if you do a trench and you put two circuits in one, you're obviously going to get a little less capacity because they're right next to each other than if they were 10 feet apart. Um, but there's multiple ways to install horizontal loops. This gives you an example. Here would be our header pit with a reverse return connection of each of the wells. And this is what we, did, what we looked at here as a four-pipe horizontal loop. That's an example of a four-pipe trench where you have two circuits in the same trench. Um, and we like these, like I said, 10 feet from each other and 10 feet from any foundation. Here's an example of a single um, a backhoe trench. Very narrow, enough just to fit two pipes. It's really easy. You're not tearing up a lot of the dirt, and you're backfilling the system. Um, bentonite grout is not used on these applications, um, only because it's close enough to the surface where we will pack the ground back down, and you will get uh, a decent contact with the soil um, uh, and the compression of that soil against the pipe over a very short period of time. 
Here's an example. Um, obviously, this trench is deep and probably qualifies for some of the OSHA safety requirements of bracing the walls. You don't want this to collapse in on you. But this is an example of how you would put multiple circuits in one trench. Uh, you would actually pin one, the supply underneath, and then return up top. Here are some other examples of horizontal trenches. Um, some people will utilize the slinky. So um, actual coil itself, um, geothermal pipe comes in a roll. So you can just stretch out the roll either in a single length, like this cross section here, or you can leave it in that slinky, un unravel it sideways, and bury that in the trench, either vertically or horizontally. Just a few other options to play with the space that you have. Um, that's why it's great to work with an outdoor loop contractor, because he can look at the space that you have, even though it's small, and they can make a determination of how much capacity they can fit in what way. One other very common um, horizontal installation application is directional boring. Now, this is becoming more prevalent in um, urban environments only because of very, very small lot lines. We don't have the capability to actually fit a drilling truck into the backyard. So what happens is we would actually have the drilling, um, the drilling rig on the street outside. They would drill down, go under foundations, under driveways, and be able to install these horizontal loops underneath the homes themselves. Um, it's a very clean installation. Um, they actually follow with this meter, and they're able to very accurately bore in and around um, other utilities or foundations or driveways and things like that. So it's a very, you know, it's a more expensive drilling method um, when you're doing a horizontal installation, but it, you know, there's a lot less ground um, maintenance afterwards. There's a lot less landscaping um, as a result of the drilling. Um, it's a very clean and very easy installation. And they can take these um, directly to the foundation wall where you can bring it into your basement. So it's another option for a lot of uh, uh, consumers with a very small lot. Pond loop is another, um, it's another option of installing a geothermal system. Um, pond loop is actually one of the least expensive installations um, next to an open loop system. Um, but a pond loop, um, basically, you would take these individually wrapped coils that the, the geothermal pipe gets shipped in, and you would connect them together and actually um, sink them in a pond or open body of water. The requirements to do a pond loop for a residential application is a half acre of water. So we need at least a half acre of water. So we're not talking a small retention pond um, or a small spring pond. We need a half acre body of water that is at least 9 or 10 feet deep at the driest part of the season. So in the middle of summer, this has to be at least 9 or 10 feet deep. Um, and a half acre body of water. We need enough capacity. Um, otherwise, we run the risk of actually freezing the entire pond solid. We don't want to do that. So um, that's the requirement for the space, and I get that question quite a bit. Um, we want the pond to be within 300 feet of the structure, only because of you know heat transfer within the ground and from the pond. Um, the ground is obviously a great heat transfer medium, but we want to keep those head pressures as, as small as possible because with a pond installation with a slinky, um, or with the pond installation, the head pressure is so great because of the coils. We want to keep that as close to the structure as possible. Um, and the interesting thing about a pond loop is the, the pond loop geothermal application actually relies on the fact that you are going to have a solid sheet of ice encompassing the pond. It is actually a good thing. Um, once you get a solid sheet of ice over a pond with a geothermal system, then the water underneath that ice actually rotates. So you get um, thermal conductivity under that water. That warmer water rises up to the, the surface where it's cooled by the ice, sinks back down. So you get good turbulence within that pond and go, good water temperature turnover. Um, it's the stagnant water that actually, um, and that's actually backwards. It's, the stagnant water doesn't work best. We want rotation of the water. So um, you actually want to look for a, a pond system that would actually freeze over and allow that water to rotate underneath. This is kind of what a typical pond or lake loop installation would look like. These coils are kind of what the, the geothermal pipe ships in. Um, and we would pipe these on reverse return as well. We would just connect each of the supply and return ends of this pipe together. You can also spread that out to get a little better um, heat transfer between the water and the pipes themselves. This is a very typical um, picture of a residential pond application. Obviously, you need to have certification or ownership of that water water or um, permission to utilize that water source if you are using a community um, pond, pond access or lake access. So you want to make sure that your consumer has 
permission to use that um, or to tap into that resource. One of the important things to point out um, for a pond loop system is you want to make sure that the penetration into the basement or foundation for a pond loop system is above grade from the rest of the body of water and the rest of the system. Um, when you are trenching a pond loop back to the house, if your home is below grade of the water, as soon as you connect that trench, that pond or water source will empty into your basement. So this seems very trivial, but it is, it is a very important component to drilling a, a pond loop trench. You want to make sure that you have an increased grade into the penetration in the foundation so that when you're installing the system, your pond does not backfill into your basement. Here is uh, one of the other options other than doing the coils. This is a nice picture of a commercial installation of a pond loop system. Um, it's very easy to do. You connect all these individual coils together. You float them out, connecting the supply and return. You float them out into the pond. And then when you flush that system with water, when you float these out, those tubes are filled with air, and it's enough to keep these buoyant. Once you flush that out with water and pressurize the system and fill it with water, they'll actually sink naturally on their own. So it's a very simple and easy installation, other than the requirement of having a boat. <laughs> One of the other options for a pond loop installation is using a plate frame heat exchanger. So this is another option, um, different capacity requirements, but it's another cheaper um, installation option for a pond loop system. Now before we talked about a header pit, this is an example of multiple trenches. As you see, this is a horizontal trench application. And like I said, everything doesn't have to be perfectly symmetrical. You don't have to have parallel lines. You just want to make sure that the majority of the system is separated by 10 feet once it gets out there. But you see this header pit system, supplying returns coming back, and they'll connect all these individual trenches in a reverse return fashion. But this is just an example of a header pit. And this is how we would pipe a reverse return fashion. So the supply coming from the system, circuit one, I'm sorry, circuit one going down, coming back is the first circuit going down is the last coming back into the system. So this basically this reverse return fashion helps negate the individual head pressure drops of each of the individual wells. So when it's piped in reverse return, then we only have to worry about the head pressure of a single circuit um, because it will balance itself out between the other circuits. Um, and it also gets even water flow to each one of the circuits as well. So it's very important to the piping method. This is an example of reverse return um, commercial manifold. Uh, just giving you an example, very easy. He's, this pipe itself is a, um, we'll talk about the pipe, but it's, an, it's a high-density polyethylene pipe with a solar coating. So the high-density polyethylene pipe is the exact same pipe that they use for um, gas pipe. Gas pipe is just colored yellow whereas geothermal pipe is solar coated and is black. Um, so it, it's very re readily available in the industry. Um, the main um, procedure that we use to attach that is, fusion, is butt fusion welding. So what happens is you would actually be certified in fusion welding. You would heat each end of the pipe, merge the pipe together, um, and that melted pipe would actually fuse to the other melted pipe on the connection and become a thicker piece of pipe. So the butt fusion welding actually makes a very um, structurally sound um, system um, basically leak-free. Um, obviously, you're going to pressure test the system, but a system that is correctly um, fusion welded um, is warranted by the factory, the pipe manufacturer, for 50 years. So this HDPE pipe, when installed correctly, is warranted for 50 years. This system is going to outlast um, the homeowners, the occupants, um, this system will be there, and it is reliable installation for geothermal if you're thinking long-term costs and payback. Flush cart is used um, in a residential system when you are filling the system. Um, if it is a pressurized flow controller, a pressurized closed-loop system, um, we would use a flush cart to not only um, flush out all the air from the system, fill it with water, but also use that to check for any change in pressure to identify leaks in the system or, you know, errors in fusion welding. So a flush cart is a necessary component when doing a closed loop pressurized system. And if you are new to the geothermal industry, um, I would recommend that you um, include in your contract with your subcontracted driller to perform this flushing function. Most of the drillers own a flush cart, um, so they can provide that to you. Um, but usually this is done after the system is completely installed. 
So that may require a return trip by that driller to come back and flush and fill the system after you've installed the unit and connected power. So I would recommend you include that in your, um, in your contract with them. Antifreeze is added to the system because of the temperature differences of the water in the ground. I mean, we are, the water that's going through the system can go anywhere from 30 degrees up to 75 degrees. So when it gets below freezing, we have to have an antifreeze in the system to make sure that water doesn't freeze within the pipe. Um, there's multiple different antifreezes or glycols that's used. Um, there's methanol and ethanol. And yes, these are jet fuels um, or race fuels. Uh, they are alcohol-based, but when they are diluted in the concentration for geothermal use, they are not flammable. Um, they're le much less hazardous. However, they are still toxic. And some um, county regulations or, you know, Local reg regulations um, prohibit the use of methanol or ethanol, so you want to check um, with your local, uh, the local standards for your area. It is the least expensive, and it is, um, has the best pumping performance. Um, when you get into cold temperatures, it, it, um, it stays very liquid, so it's easy to pump. Ethylene glycol is another glycol that's commonly used in car antifreeze. It is also less expensive. Um, not quite as expensive as the propylene glycol, but it is also considered toxic. Um, but it is something that's used in the system. Keep in mind, these antifreezes are used in a closed loop system. So if it is properly installed and properly pressure tested to identify any leaks um, and, you know, connect any leaks, that system should never leak. It should, you know, once it is sealed and filled and pressure tested, those closed loop systems will last 50 years. So it should never leak. Um, so you'll see use, use of multiple different types of antifreezes. But more and more um, regulations are going to this propylene glycol, which is food grade and it is safe for consumption um, if, for whatever reason, it did bleed into an aquifer or another groundwater source. Um, it is non-toxic. However, it is more expensive. Um, and also, it gets, um, it gets uh, thicker. Uh, it turns more into a slurry at lower temperatures, so it is harder to pump. When, it, when you're using propylene glycol, you will have to do a pump selection to handle the additional head pressure drop of utilizing propylene glycol. So that's why I mentioned before there needs to be good communication between the outdoor loop contractor and whoever's sizing those pumps for that system. Um, percentage base, anywhere from 5 to 10 percent if you're using methanol or ethanol, up to 25 percent using propylene glycol is the percentage of glycol mixed into the system. Now, propylene glycol itself will actually degrade the, the heat extra or the heat transfer of the system, uh, which is why you need to take that into consideration with your design of your field as well. I get a lot of questions asked on the typical installation time of a geothermal system, and basically it's, it's, very, it's very short. The equipment itself it's very straightforward. It's the same as installing a traditional piece of uh, HVAC equipment, whether it be a furnace or air conditioner. Um, the nice thing is it's a single self-contained unit, so you're only installing one piece. Uh, for the loop itself, one to two days commonly for residential installation. Um, it, it's not an extended installation time or you know disruption to the consumer activity um, or the homeowner's activity. So it, it's relatively easy to install. Talking about the pipe. Um, uh, HDPE um, pipe, high density polyethylene pipe is what's used, and I mentioned that it is the same as what they use for gas piping, it just has a solar coating, so it's black. Um, typically for geothermal applications, um, we use the ASTM PE3408, so 3408 is the specific type of polyethylene pipe, uh, type thickness coating, etc., that we use for geothermal applications, that is warranted for 50 years um, with correct installation. Um, they also sell pre-assembled headers and manifolds, um, things that you can use to connect the different pipes, the U-bends, et cetera. Um, pipe is very easy to come by, and uh, working with it and getting to know the fusion welding procedures is something that you will have to educate yourself on if you do choose to do that. All right, we're on the, the home run here. Um, Want to go over quickly the government incentives, certifications, and resources that are available to you if you're doing geothermal designs or applications. Um, obviously, the most common um, that's propelling the industry is the federal tax credit. For residential homeowners, um, you can qualify for a one-time tax credit on a single home of 30% of the total investment. Now, the difference between this and some of the other tax credits is there is no dollar value cap. So if your installation costs $30,000, you would have $10,000 um, as a, a tax credit to you. 
Um, if your installation costs $90,000, that's $30,000 as a tax credit to you. And the nice thing is that tax credit would continue to roll over year to year until you're able to claim the full amount. Um, some people may itemize and not have enough to claim $30,000 as a credit in, the, in one year. Um, so that leftover amount would continue to roll over for that homeowner and they would get that full tax credit amount, um, even though that may extend beyond you know, 2016. The other important component to mention is the way that that tax credit is written is that it includes geothermal equipment and its distribution in the system, meaning that anything that is connected to the geothermal unit that enables it to operate or perform is included in this tax credit. So the geothermal unit itself, the um, loop field, the pipe, the labor, um, the indoor components, um, if it's a brand new installation, um, you know, the indoor components themselves as well. If you are using a water-to-water -water system, um, you could potentially include the radiant system as part of the distribution of that geothermal system. Um, you wouldn't be able to claim a boiler, obviously, but if you're using a water-to-water -water system to heat via radiant floor, you can incorporate that radiant floor and labor for that as well, the, the tube um, and some of the labor as part of that tax credit. Um, it would be a comprehensive number that um, that homeowner would take to their accountant and then take 30% of that um, and file a special tax form. There's information on, uh, for the consumers on many of the websites at carryonbryantgeo.com for the homeowners that you can present to them and how to claim those tax credits. And each manufacturer does have a certification of approval for the tax credit as well. Commercially, um, a commercial installation um, they're able to have a 10% tax credit of the total investment, similar to the residential, but 10%, not 30, um, for the commercial system installation and equipment. And they also can claim an accelerated depreciation on the system, I think for an additional five years um, from the installation. Um, but they do have a benefit for the commercial installations as well. Obviously, keep in mind that they have to pay taxes to get access to a tax credit. <laughs> Excuse me. So if it is a church or another application, as a contractor, you would work with them to claim some of the credit as a contractor and share that benefit with them. Um, as you know, right now, that tax credit is extended till December 31st of 2016. So we have a good four years to utilize that tax credit and help you use that to propel the industry and uh, you know bring some more awareness to the consumers that are making those decisions. Briefly, legislation and other federal programs that are out there, um, Save Sensible Accounting to Value Engineer, um, Rural Energy for American Programming. These are basically fundings for people to actually get geothermal technology, to finance geothermal technology for themselves. Um, the DOE is working to help fund geothermal um, plant systems for larger commercial applications or commercial installations. So working with the government to fund a, um, a geothermal plant serving an entire subdivision, um, a single geothermal well that serves the entire subdivision or an entire campus. Um, funding for that is, is going through with Senate bills as well. State and local incentives, um, one of the most important resources is DESIRE. Um, DESIRE is a database for, of state incentives for renewable, uh, renewables and efficiency. So this will actually list every um, incentive out there for renewables, uh, renewable energies for each state. So there's there's some, they'll list what the state is offering um, itself. So at least 49 states have at least one um, geothermal incentive. So it's a great place to reference and to go to. Website for Desire was www.dsireusa.org. Um, some other points of reference from the Department of Energy for some of their tax rebates. Um, and the EPA to locate Energy Star certifications for different geothermal equipment. Um, one other important point that I want to point out before I close out the presentation is we now see um, a greater installation standard um, and certification for geothermal. Um, there are multiple organizations, three in particular, that have spearheaded this effort. Um, the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, the Geothermal Exchange Organization, and the International Ground Source Heat Pump Association. More commonly, IGSPA, which is the International Ground Source Heat Pump Association, has been instrumental in certifying drillers for geothermal applications um, for a while. But now the combination of these three institutes is certifying not only drillers, but designers and installers. So now they're actually providing certification for designers. And in the future, 
you may see requirements on local state codes to have this certification to design or install a geothermal system, whether you're the driller or not. So um, they are offering trainings and programs through um, these three organizations for certification for geothermal design and installation. Something to be aware of and uh, something to look at for the future for additional geothermal training in detail. Um, some of those resources, here's some of the websites that we have for those different um, organizations. You can reference, get information on different trainings that are offered in your area, or just up-to-date information on the geothermal marketplace itself. That kind of wraps up the presentation for today. Like I said, it's very comprehensive, and we, we shoved a lot of information into one afternoon session, so hopefully you took something away from it. If you have any questions, I've had everyone on mute for the entire presentation, so if you have questions, please feel free to type them in or contact me directly. Um, as I go through, I will answer all your questions. You're more than welcome to email me or call me directly. Um, this was part of our every, every Monday at noon webinar training session. Um, TEC and HVAC Solutions also does on-site lab training. We have an operational lab where people can come in and train. We have a, a demonstration truck that comes around and brings equipment out to people to do training or so you can kick the tires on different pieces of equipment or technologies. Um, going back to the webinar schedule, today was the heat, geothermal heat pumps. Um, next Monday will be chill water plant optimization, and you can see some of the other technologies that we have coming up, everything from air handlers, um, to variable speed heat pumps, um, to energy recovery systems, um, indoor air quality um, products and services. Um, we have duct-free splits on here. So there's a lot of different technologies that we're offering um, training on during these Monday webinars. And we do record all the webinars, and they're accessible to you to download. As I mentioned, next Monday at noon is chill water plant optimization. Mike Smith's going to go through um, how to lay out maybe a geochiller system or some other type of chiller system. Um, and what the most, um, the, the way that you can lay that system out to get the most bang for your buck as far as um, pressures and uh, um, head pressures of the system and uh, utilizing laid out piping and things like that. Thank you very much. At this time, I'm going to go through and try and answer some of the questions. But I appreciate your time and I appreciate you sticking with me for majority of this presentation. Have a great day. And I'll go through and answer questions now and hopefully get to everyone.